Welcome to lecture 18 of 1413. This lecture is about gender discrimination and identity. Okay, so what's the uh, agenda today? Today we're going to talk about gender and identity and particularly discrimination. Um, first, I'm going to give you a broad, a quick overview of why this is an important um, area to, to, to study. Then I'm going to give you an equally brief um, uh, overview of the gender gap what, um, uh, in wages and the fact that women earn less money than men for equal um, work. Um, how that has uh, evolved over time and how much still is left of this gender gap. Then we're going to talk for a little bit about potential technological solutions. Can we use technology to improve um, or to reduce discrimination um, potentially? And the answer will be yes to some extent, but technology will not solve everything. Then we're going to talk about two particular important issues. One is beliefs and people's um, updating about beliefs um, when it comes to like men and women and their skills. Um, and then we're going to talk about gender identity norms in particular, um, which is sort of the idea that people's uh, deeply held beliefs about what um, should be done in society or not might affect their behavior. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about demand and supply for different tasks. So in particular, I'm going to show you that women are um, more likely to say yes to what's called non-promotable tasks, tasks that are good for society but perhaps not good for their career, or tasks that are good for like a company or university as a whole but are not good, are not promotable in the sense that they, they help women in fact uh, get promoted. So women are more likely to say yes to those things. In addition, uh, on top of that, precisely because they're more likely to say yes, they're also more likely to be asked in the first place, which sort of amplifies that difference. I'm going to tell you about this in more detail. The first question you might ask is, why study gender differences? I have four answers for you. The first one is simple equity, fairness, and justice issues. People simply should be rewarded equally for the same output. So if a man and a woman works um, uh, equally many hours and is equally productive, they should be paid the same. And um, uh, if that's not the case, that's not uh, that's unequal, that's unfair, and not um, uh, unjust or not justified. Now, um, there might be an additional uh, equity and fairness issues that men and women might not even be allowed to work as much. Um, uh, men and women might not be allowed to work as much as uh, as men. That's an additional sort of fairness um, concern. Second, there's an efficiency argument, which is overall productivity and welfare falls if women and other groups are held back by discrimination and other distortions. And indeed, a substantial share of recent U.S. growth can be explained by the improved allocation of talent in the economy. Um, so this is just a simple idea that, well, if we um, exclude certain groups, including women, from certain jobs, the most talented people in those groups um, will not be allowed to um, some of the most talented people in those groups might not be allowed to do those jobs, and that's bad for society overall. Mm -hmm. Think about, for example, doctors. If women cannot be doctors, well, then we will essentially just exclude um, a, a large fraction of the most talented people in terms of like being doctors, um, the smartest, brightest, and hardest working um, um, uh, 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 women, and that will be uh, uh, worse, uh, not just for those women, but it will also be bad for uh, medical, medical care, innovation, and so on in the medical profession, because it's, we just essentially exclude some of the best people from uh, that type of work. And if you want to learn more about this, the people that see it out uh, is an excellent sort of discussion of, of, of this issue. Um, third, we might learn about the um, formation of preferences and personality by studying gender. And here the idea is that there are, um, uh, in many cases, differences in uh, preferences, such as risk preferences, social preferences, and taste for competition or competitiveness, but also in attitudes towards negotiation or other things such as identity, aspirations, or over or under confidence more generally. Well, so. Uh, if there are these differences at later ages, we can sort of learn about the formation of those preferences and personality um, by uh, looking, for instance, at like um, people at different ages and uh, uh, try to understand at which ages those differences emerge. For instance, you might um, look at like five-year-olds or 10-year-olds or 15-year-olds and look at their risk and social preferences and then try to understand when those gender gaps, if any, uh, emerge over time. 
And that will allow us then to understand um, questions of nature versus nurture, whether there are inherent differences in preferences and personality overall, just men and women are just different inherently for some reason, or um, uh, it could be that uh, uh, it's really about socialization and education and the like. Uh, girls and boys are just treated very differently by their parents, by their social environments, their teachers, and so on. And that might create such differences in preferences and other uh, behaviors. So that's a, another reason to study those. You're going to mostly focus on, on number one, and just simply the idea that or the objective that people should be rewarded equally um, for the same um, um, output. Now, what is the gender gap, or what do I mean when I talk about the gender gap? So Claudia Golden, who is a um, uh, eminent researcher at Harvard, um, who has done a lot of seminal work um, on, on gender, the economics of gender, has written a very nice overview paper in 2014 and uh, giving an overview of what, what do we know and how far have we come in trying to reduce and close the um, gender gap. Um, the graph that I'm showing you here summarizes this discussion fairly well. Um, it's a bit of a messy graph, so let me show you what it shows. I'll tell you what it shows. On the x-axis, you see people's age from 20 to 70. On the y-axis, you see the log of female to male earnings, or average female to male earnings, which is essentially a measure of the gender gap. And so um, uh, the difference in log is essentially the percentage difference in uh, female versus male earnings. So minus 0.3, you would think of that as, a, that as like 30% difference in uh, uh, female versus male um, earnings. What do we see here? Well, A, we see like a pretty large gender gap anywhere in this graph. Uh, I should have also said different lines are now different cohorts. Um, so these are like starting in 1923. These are people born in 1923, 28, 33, 38, 43, and so on in five-year intervals um, uh, from the, the oldest to like more recent um, cohorts. Now, what do we see? We see a significant gender gap everywhere in this graph um, or in all lines of the graph. We see that um, uh, uh, the gender gap, even for the uh, most recent cohort, seems to be about 20 to 30 percent. We see that the gender gap has um, fallen. So when you look at like the most, um, the oldest cohorts, the gender gap was even larger um, than the more recent cohorts. We also see that there's sort of this um, U-shape, but we seem to find that the gender gap um, starts emerging uh, uh, already at like age um, uh, 27, 28, 30. There's already a gender gap of something like 10 to 15%, even for the most recent cohorts. But then that gender gap gets magnified um, uh, towards like uh, you know, uh, 20, 30, 40% um, uh, until like about age 40 to 45 when it sort of like plateaus and maybe like um, falls a bit um, overall. And so what, what do we learn here? Well, we say, well, there's substantial um, female labor market gains over the last half century, but large gender gaps um, remain. In 2010, um, for instance, the ratio of mean annual earnings between uh, male and female workers, these are people who work full-time, full year, 20 to 25 to 69 years, was 0.72, and that of the median was 0.77. Notice that these, the figure here uh, it controls for work time and education. So while, of course, it might also be the case, and it's indeed the case, that women work fewer hours and days than men do, um, even conditional on work time education, there's a significant gap, gender gap remaining of something like 20 to 30 percent um, uh, that women are paid less for uh, equal um, work. Now, first, um, what are some of the reasons why there have been substantial female um, labor market gains over the last half century? Well, um, there's quite a few uh, uh, technological and other explanatory factors. One uh, big factor was a reduction in the gender gap in education. Women are just now more able and uh, 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 can afford to um, receive education. That's true for both primary and secondary um, education, but also in particular for university or higher, um, higher education more generally. Second, there's been technological innovations such as the pill, dishwasher, and so on, which um, um, allowed women to do um, more work outside of the household. Um, there have also been like labor demand shifts, in particular, uh, as the US economy has been moving from uh, uh, manufacturing and agriculture towards um, uh, uh, services. Um, women tend to have comparative advantages in uh, services compared to like in particular hard manual 
Um, and so these labor demand shifts then have disproportionately um, uh, benefited um, women. Uh, finally, there's been also lower discrimination, in particular, um, uh, stronger regulatory controls and increased market competitiveness. Uh, uh, for the latter, it's the idea that if there's more competition, uh, firms cannot afford to um, uh, discriminate as much um, because it's actually a costly thing to do to, to hire incompetent men uh, compared to competent um, women. Now, uh, we're going to now discuss a paper by Golden and Rouse, um, which is a, an example of a simple technological solution. In particular, it's the question whether uh, blind auditions in orchestras increased uh, gender ratios in those orchestras. So, you know, it's the fact that people, uh, 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 the blind auditions were introduced, did that contribute to the increase in the gender ratio in orchestras? What do I mean by the increase in gender ratios in the orchestras? So, even until the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, there have been shockingly low female ratios in top orchestras and orchestras um, more generally. Now, um, uh, and these ratios were uh, below 10% in, uh, in many orchestras. Um, and only recently in the 80s and 90s in particular, there have been like stark increases in the number of women uh, who, who play or in those orchestras. Um, this increase, um, was the case in the top five orchestras, but also has been uh, have been similar improvements in gender ratios in other orchestras, which you can read in the in the, in the report that I linked in the uh, in the slides. Now, um, one really important reason here uh, seems to have been um, blatant sexism, even by very renowned or in particular by renowned um, conductors, which you can I'm not going to re repeat here, but you can read it in, in section one of the paper by Golden Rose. And so one question is like, well, is, 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 does this sexism and discrimination, has that contributed to um, the uh, low gender ratio in, uh, in orchestras? Now, um, while there have been all these improvements in the um, gender ratio in like musicians gen in general, there still are vast differences in conductors and the number of conductors and music directors. They're essentially uh, predominantly male still. Moreover, while there have been a lot of improvements in terms of gender, most musicians are still um, white. So in particular, um, African Americans and Latinos are uh, uh, very much underrepresented in uh, orchestras. Now, let me uh, uh, tell you a short aside about women in economics. Um, this is not just the case that in orchestras, um, the fraction of women is low, that's also true in, in, in economics. Um, and here's sort of an overview of that. There's a, a, a quite nice overview paper by uh, Lindbergh and Stearns from 2019, which essentially says that some progress has been made, but lots more needs to be done. And more recently in particular, some of the progress seems to have stalled. What, what do we mean by that? Well, here this graph shows the fraction of um, uh, women in different stages of the profession, ranging from senior majors here at the top to um, first year PhD students to assistant professors, new PhDs, assistant professors, uh, associate professors, and full professors. And what you see here, there seems to be some trend that's upwards, in particular for full professors and associate professors, which is, which is of course, good. Um, um, uh, uh, there's less of a positive trend um, to be seen, when it, particularly when it comes to assistant professors. And here you essentially see, since 2000, uh, about 2007 uh, or, or six, there has been no increase, if anything, like a decrease in the fraction of female assistant professors. Um, uh, but even like the uh, fraction of uh, PhD students is uh, clearly below 50%. And so the profession is starting to understand and address, address the issues in particular to try to reduce um, uh, uh, sexism and other um, uh, uh, issues holding women back. There's, for example, um, uh, uh, some particularly nice examples of the cement mentoring programs, which are trying to um, support um, female and uh, minority uh, assistant professors in, in, in terms of mentoring and trying to sort of foster their careers, which has um, uh, been shown to um, impact and significantly uh, improve the, the, the profession. But when it's fourth in uh, 1413, uh, the majority of students tends to be um, female. And moreover, the best students tend to be female um, as well. So I very much hope you are still interested and uh, all the well students are very much still interested in economics and will pursue a career in economics, um, uh, perhaps academically. 
Now back to orchestras. So many orchestras introduced blind auditions in the 1970s and 1980s. And um, if you look back at the graph that I showed you, um, this graph here, you see in the, in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, that's also the time when there was a sharp increase in the uh, share of women in, in, in those orchestras. So um, uh, you can see here in the graph, um, um, orchestras, if you want to get a job in orchestras, you have to do auditions. Um, these auditions are very, very competitive and often have like several stages. They're preliminary, semifinals, and finals in many orchestras. What you see here is uh, 11 uh, anonymized orchestras, including the top orchestras in the US, and the introduction of blind auditions in those orchestras. What you see is that um, most orchestras did introduce blind auditions, at least in some of their um, uh, uh, stages of the auditions. However, many of them also only introduce it in some stages, but not in others. Now, you can think already um, that that's not uh, sufficient in some cases. If you have only like blind auditions in the preliminaries, but not in the semifinals or finals, you might sort of reduce discrimination in the preliminaries, but then if women are discriminated in the semifinals or finals, that's not going to help them get hired, which at the end of the day, we of course um, care about. Now, Golden and Bruce look at technological solutions and, and um, uh, look at the question of whether such te technological solutions, in fact, can help. Now, um, uh, the question they ask now is looking at data from actual additions, often using individual fixed effects, do these blind additions, the introduction of blind additions, help candidates reach the next round or, in particular, get hired? Now, uh, the data is fairly rich and often includes or allows for the inclusion of individual fixed effects. That is the case. If you look at the musicians, Golden and Bruce are going to ask the question, uh, is a particular um, uh, uh, musician more likely to um, make it to the next round um, when auditions are blinded? And is that more likely the case for female than for male um, musicians? Now, what do they find? Overall, they find evidence that blind auditions, per, um, uh, blind audition procedures fostered impartiality in hiring and increased the proportion of women in uh, symphony orchestras. Now, there's some caveats here that, you know, some of these estimates are fairly imprecise, in particular at later stages, because the number of um, uh, observation was quite a bit, uh, down quite a bit. There's um, uh, some of these results are a little bit um, mixed. But overall, the evidence suggests that these blind auditions did indeed foster impartiality and helped women uh, uh, succeed in um, uh, getting jobs, in particular in these top orchestras in the US. Now, why are these results perhaps somewhat less clear cut? I already told you, like, one reason is that in later rounds, the number of observations gets kind of small because, you know, only so many people make it to the later rounds. But there's another reason, which is the uh, uh, auditions have several rounds, not all of which were blinded. Now, if there's one, uh, if there's discrimination in one round but not in the next one, um, there's this issue that in the next round there will be like selection. And in particular, um, uh, the discriminated people who make it to the next round, you expect them to do better, right? If there's discrimination against women in the first round, um, uh, but not in the second, you think that like women in the second round will do better because only the best women will make it to the second second round, uh, uh, because otherwise they will be. Um, screened out in the first uh, round due to um, discrimination. Right? And if that's the case, then like making comparisons in later rounds is, is potentially biased or, or problematic because you're comparing essentially different types of people uh, in different rounds. And that, and, and that might, might uh, lead to the results being less clear-cut overall. Let me give you another example. Suppose um, uh, uh, male and female workers get rated in a task. Suppose, a, suppose that's a coding task online where you essentially see the output, but you also see their gender. Now, suppose women get rated systematically worse due to sexism and no other reason. Suppose women and men are exactly the same in the work they do, but some men are sexist and they're going to rate women worse. Now, for any given score, you should expect the women, uh, woman that you hire compared to any other random man that you hire to do better um, than that man. Um, and the reason being that they have been like systematically disadvantaged um, due to the sexism in the rating to start with. Now, uh, you should think about this because you know uh, there's also some um, evidence of uh, teaching evaluations being biased against women. Now, if you see a man and a woman uh, with the exact same teaching rating, 
well, you probably want to take the woman's class because the woman has been, uh, the female professor has been uh, discriminated to start with, um, having that high score or the similarly high score as the male professor is, is, is more impressive and uh, likely will indicate that the class will be better. There's an excellent paper by Boren et al. that considers the issue of the, the dynamics of um, discrimination in much more detail if you're interested in learning more about that. Now, despite those technological solutions and advances that I mentioned to you, substantial, uh, substantial um, uh, uh, gender gaps um, um, remain. So while, uh, as I told you, um, the gender gaps has been reduced both in terms of labor market or labor force participation, how many uh, days and hours, or how many women overall, how many days and hours since women work, and in their wages and earnings, how much they're being paid conditional on uh, working, um, uh, uh, there, there are still substantial gender gaps. Uh, in particular, women's um, uh, labor market participation has plateaued since uh, the early 1990s. And even now, among entering cohorts, women still earn significantly less than men. And that's true even for conditional on work time and vacation. That's the graph that I was showing you earlier. Now, given that there are these persistent remaining gender gaps, um, even though uh, a lot of the technological and other barriers have been reduced, now women are educated or as educated as men are, and there's less technological barriers that, that uh, uh, preclude women from working, um, researchers have now started to consider some of the less traditional within economics um, factors, including things as, such as risk attitudes, negotiation skills, taste for competition, um, uh, but also, and this is what we're going to focus on, beliefs, and um, social norms and identity. I'm gonna first talk about beliefs and then we're gonna talk about social norms and identity. Um, before we get to beliefs about gender and people's women's and men's skills, I'm gonna tell you very briefly about a seminal paper by Bertrand and Mulanathan from 2004 that randomizes or randomized names and job applications. So what did Bertrand and Mulanathan do? They essentially um, uh, uh, sent out job applications that were otherwise identical, um, male and female um, uh, workers. These are fictitious job applications. And they sent them to employers and then looked at callback rates by those employers. Um, and the only thing that was like uh, buried in those applications was the name on the application. And what did they do? Well, they used um, white sounding names such as Emily and Greg as well as African-American sounding names such as Lakeisha and Jamal. And then they looked at, well, were these um, uh, applications when they had white sounding names and were otherwise identical, more successful than applications by uh, uh, names with African-American sounding, uh, uh, African uh, sounding names, and again, that were otherwise identical. And uh, uh, Bertrand and Mulanathan find a striking key result that callback rates for white sounding names were 50% higher than for African American sounding names. That's a huge difference. Um, and that's important not just because it's like a hassle because you have to send out more applications, but if you get called back more, you're more likely to be um, interviewed or asked for an interview. You're more likely to actually get the job. You're more likely to, um, uh, less likely to be unemployed. And um, you might also be um, uh, less likely to just stop searching whatsoever because you might be dis uh, disappointed or discouraged. So that's a huge difference. And essentially, um, uh, a discrimination against um, African Americans um, uh, uh, was blatantly obvious um, from this research. Numerous other studies um, show gender and racial biases uh, in various ways. These are ranging um, uh, from very similar studies, including these audit studies where people are sent resumes with the like, um, but also ranging to studies where like people on eBay try to sell things, uh, where like they try to sell like an iPod or I, um, uh, iPhone, and they hold that iPhone um, with a hand that's either like white or, or non-white, and then they find essentially that uh, white hands are more likely to sell their um, uh, iPhones than uh, non-white hands. Now, this is a very important and, and depressing result. One thing to flag here that it's hard to distinguish statistical from taste-based discrimination. We can talk more about this in, in recitation. What do I mean by that? Well, it might be that there's uh, uh, people have a preference for white applicants. 
That is to say, controlling for performance, it might just be that people are um, racist and they'd rather have like white applicants than um, uh, uh, African-American applicants. Uh, this is what economists would call uh, uh, case-based discrimination, uh, which essentially is conditional on the performance. People just like certain types of people better um, than others, and therefore they call them or more likely to call them better. A different explanation is a belief-based explanation. It might be that employers think that African-American applicants will perform worse, even controlling for all other aspects of the resume. So it could be essentially you see uh, people see this um, uh, name and they think that, well, even if the resume is good, that person will not perform work, uh, uh, as well as somebody with a white sounding name. Notice that these beliefs could be correct or not, um, uh, but in any case, we will, uh, and that's, we'll talk about this in recitation as well. Uh, economists, again, would call this statistical discrimination. This could be, again, correct statistical discrimination or statistical discrimination that's uh, uh, based on biased um, beliefs. But either way, these things um, jointly um, led to clear discrimination of African-American uh, uh, applications, which in turn might lead to uh, striking differences in uh, uh, unemployment or job finding uh, rates, rates across races. We're going to now focus on um, beliefs, um, and in particular about beliefs about skills and how people update on those beliefs, depending on the gender of the person they're updating on. The paper we're going to consider now is the paper by SAR since 2019, um, which considers how people interpret signals in the labor market. The question that SARS is asked here is whether somebody's gender influences the way uh, we interpret information about this person and about his or her peers. What do I mean by that? Well. Uh, in many situations, when people um, uh, do certain tasks and perform at work, um, uh, good things and bad things happen. Now, you can infer from those things that uh, occur from these events, you can infer something about their uh, competence and their performance. Now, many of these situations are ambiguous in the sense it could be that the person was just really lucky, or it could be that the person is really, really good at what they're doing. Now, what Sarsons is asking when we see those events, so when people see those events, are um, people interpreting those events differently for men versus women? So for example, if a, if a man, if something bad happens at work, um, a boss might um, react to that uh, person differently or in, in, uh, update their beliefs about um, the person's skills differently depending whether it's a man or a woman. In addition, the boss might also um, uh, update differently about the peers. So if a woman makes a mistake, the boss might not only um, update uh, his beliefs about um, uh, uh, this woman, but also about all other women that work for him. Similarly, for a man, of course, the boss might do the same. Um, and what Heather uh, Sarsis now asks is the question, but is this updating or the interpretation of information differently for male versus female um, workers? Now, why do we care? Well, we care a lot about this because hiring, promotion, and wage decisions hinge on information about workers' ability. And in particular, if there's systematic differences in how information about men and women is interpreted, that could lead to differences in hiring, promotion, and wage decisions, and in turn, might contribute to the gender gap. What does Sarsons do to answer this question? She looks at how do physicians change referrals to surgeons and appears um, after a patient, uh, uh, after certain patient outcomes. Now, um, what do I mean by that? Well, physicians often refer patients needing surgery to a local surgeon. So if somebody breaks their arm or the like, well, many physicians can't do this on their own, so they will refer um, this patient to a local surgeon. Now, the referral choice reflects the physician's beliefs about um, the surgeon's uh, ability. Right, you want to you, you uh, do the best for your um, uh, patient, and you want to uh, send that patient or patient to like the best possible surgeon. So if you have the suspicion, if you think a certain surgeon is not competent, you better not send your uh, patient to that surgeon, in part because you might care a lot about the patient, in part because you know um, uh, if you make bad referrals, that might also reflect on you um, eventually. Now, what does Sarsons do specifically? 
she um, to document whether um, the reaction uh, uh, depends on the surgeon's gender. What does uh, uh, Sarsons do? She matches on uh, surgeon and patient characteristics on her procedures. That is to say, she takes male and female uh, surgeons and patient characteristics and procedures, which is like, you know, um, uh, broken arms versus like more complicated procedures. So she matches all of those characteristics um, such that in the observations that she has, surgeons only differ by gender. And then she considers what we call like an event study which is comparing how physicians react to um, male and female surgeons when good and bad things um, happen. Let me now show you um, more precisely what we mean. So we have here on the x-axis quarters. On the y-axis, we have the referrals from the physicians to the performing surgeon. So these are essentially um, uh, dyads of pairs of physicians and performing surgeons. And uh, you see here, minus one is normalized to be zero. zero. And then essentially you see the evolution of uh, the referrals from a specific physician to a performing uh, surgeon. These are men and women, and these are essentially cases in which there is no adverse event. What are adverse events are like a patient's death, for example. What you see here essentially, these are men and women that are matched. They're supposed to look exactly the same. And what we see here is that referrals increase over time. Uh, uh, they tend to sort of increase uh, um, fairly steeply over time and then sort of plateau off over, over, uh, over time. The exact um, shape and pattern of this relationship doesn't matter so much. However, what matters is that men and women look uh, exactly um, uh, the same, right? So the, so the performing surgeon is here. The gender here um, that varies is the gender of the performing surgeon. Now then she looks at, uh, Sarsis looks at cases in which there is an adverse event. Again, the adverse event happens uh, uh, around here. Um, so what you see here is then, um, when there is an adverse event, there's a clear um, um, uh, uh, punishment in the sense that like, the male surgeon now gets fewer referrals um, um, from, the, uh, uh, from the physician uh, uh, right after the adverse event happens. So this is manifested by the blue bars being lower than um, the uh, gray bars. Notice that the number doesn't go down. It's still above. Everything here is above the red line. So it's just the, um, uh, uh, the, the physician is not uh, increasing the um, referrals over time anymore, or that increase gets dampened by the adverse event. This is for the male surgeon. Let's look at now what happens to the female surgeon. What we see here is like a clear difference that opens up after the adverse event. Notice that there's no pre-trends here. Before, it looks men and women or ma female and male surgeons, including the red and the blue bars, look exactly the same. But the bar, the difference only opens up after the adverse event. And there's a pretty large gap you can see that, that, that shows up in the referrals. And this gap is way larger um, uh, if you compare the red versus the uh, gray lines. It's way larger compared to the gap that emerges between the blue and the gray lines. So what we see here is that uh, both men and women are punished in the sense of receiving fewer referrals um, after an adverse event. That punishment is way more severe for female than for male surgeons. Now let's do the same for uh, the absence of a, a good event or an actually good events that happen. What's a good event? Well, like uh, it's essentially a surprisingly good thing that happened where there's a complicated surgery and the person does really well. Um, what you see here is again sort of the the the, the uh, men and women that look uh, pretty much exactly uh, the same. You can see like here, maybe men are doing slightly better uh, uh, overall, but overall these gray lines look very similar over time. Now, if there's a good event that happens, you see essentially men get like very much like rewarded. If the male surgeon does well, um, uh, uh, he gets rewarded in the sense of like receiving a lot more um, uh, referrals from the PCP, from the, from the doctor. Now, if you do the same for a um, female surgeon, again, uh, uh, female surgeons benefit from that, but the increase in referrals is a lot lower than uh, uh, for men. So again, both men and women, uh, there is a reaction to that information, to like a good or a bad event, but the reaction tends to be much stronger, much more favorable for men. In terms of the good events, men get rewarded more for the good events and women get punished more for um, bad events, or surprising bad events that happen. Let me summarize the main results. After a bad outcome, after, for example, like a patient death, uh, 
there's a 34 decrease in referrals to female surgeon, surgeons, and there's a stagnation in referrals to male surgeons. So essentially, women tend to be, get punished quite a lot, men uh, a little bit in the sense that like referrals don't go up anymore, but the punishment is much less. Now, strikingly, physicians are also less likely to refer to other female surgeons. That is to say, if a female surgeon, if, if a patient dies for a female surgeon, the physician is also less likely to refer uh, uh, patients or future patients to other female surgeons. These other female surgeons, nobody has died there. So uh, essentially what seems to be the case is that um, the physicians also are updating about women or female surgeons in general if there is um, a, a negative event that happens, which is sort of very striking. After a good outcome, uh, uh, such as like unanticipated survival, uh, there's a doubling of referrals to male surgeons, but only a 70% increase in referrals to female surgeons. And there, here, there's no spillovers to, to, to other female surgeons, um, so it's easy. So um, again, what do we find here? Well, we find that women are punished way more for unexpected bad events, and they're rewarded less for um, uh, uh, unexpected um, good events. That is to say, it's not just the case that like, um, there's more updating going on in a sense, maybe you learn more from good and bad events because maybe you have like, um, less information about men and women to start with. That's not the case here. What is here the case is that um, there's more updating or more punishment for mistakes for women and um, less reward for uh, good things that happen uh, or for good events for, for women as well. Now, why do these asymmetries matter? Well, one important issue here is that women have fewer chances to make mistakes. And in particular, if there's like dropping out, if like if, if women don't get promoted or if they even drop out, um, that leads to like lower skill accumulation and you know women will be just less qualified overall in the end because they have like less chances to get promoted um, uh, 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 and get more responsibility and so on and so forth and then they even drop out a role and we just have fewer women in the profession. Now, moreover, usually wage gaps are measured conditional and skills industry and position. But if there's biased evaluations that, that lead to differences in skills and positions in the workplace, not only is it the case that women are um, receiving like wage gaps conditional on those skills, but they also have different skills and positions in the workplace because of biased evaluations. So that's an additional scope for uh, discrimination and differences in uh, uh, earnings and so on. And then importantly, this is also not a mistake that can get corrected over time because if women drop out in particular, then, um, or if there's no referrals that happen anymore, then the doctor or any other person might not um, receive any signals anymore from women, right? If you sort of update on, on a particular person that this per, uh, patient of mine died because I sent them to, to that person, if you then think, you know, this person is terrible and don't um, send any further patients anymore, you will never learn that this woman was in fact very much highly qualified and that was just an accident that could have happened to anyone. So that's a really important issue that, um, so when women are underrepresented, uh, employers see fewer, fewer outcomes overall, and if there's updates more after bad outcomes, um, uh, uh, or in particular, if there's also updates about all women, then um, there will be fewer chances um, uh, to learn. And uh, if then women are let go and so on, uh, or less likely to be hired, then uh, there will be no chance of actually correcting those beliefs. Uh, strikingly, as I told you, um, what's really important um, uh, as a result is that there does, seems to be like updating, not just about like one specific woman overall after the negative events, but also about all other um, uh, uh, other women um, um, that that get punished for um, the bad event that happens, and if that's the case, well, if if there's several women in the profession and all women always have to pay for any bad events that happen for any woman, and sometimes you know mistakes in fact happen, that's of course terrible because that sort of amplifies um, uh, uh, a lot of the updating because uh, even if somebody makes no mistakes whatsoever. Uh, negative updates happen on their performance if other women um, um, perform uh, negatively in some ways. Now, one question you might ask is, well, couldn't we just use algorithms, machine learning, etc., to overcome such biases? 
right in particular, and sort of hiring and so on, you couldn't be use um, um, algorithms and machine learning to, to to train those algorithms, and you know instead of use computers instead of humans, and then you know uh, we might get rid of those biases. Well, one key problem with that is that algorithms themselves can be biased. Now, why is that? Is well, we train um, algorithms based on human decisions. Uh, as an example, if you train an algorithm, um, uh, and this is in fact what, what um, some companies did, based on actual decisions, if you ask the question, this if you, if you train the algorithm on actual um, hiring decisions or interview decisions where you say, well, would this person be um, uh, invited, or is this person, or is this resume likely to be um, invited for an interview? Well, if those interviewing decisions to start with were biased, based on sexism, racism, and so on, if you train your algorithm on it, then very much you uh, make that algorithm biased as well. Now, crucially, um, that's of course uh, uh, problematic, um, and, and very much would like to avoid that, and so we want to be very careful. But crucially, um, some of these biases can be uh, perhaps easier or fixed, and perhaps fixed more easily um, than biases in human decision making. Right? If somebody is sexist or racist, it's very hard to fix this, um, uh, at least in the short run. Um, however, uh, an algorithm um, essentially is just doing whatever we train them to do. So if we build equity concerns into the objective function of an algorithm, then we can essentially reduce or even eliminate um, uh, uh, these biases explicitly um, because the algorithm is explicitly um, asked to do so. And so this is a fascinating, if you want to learn more about this overall, it's a fascinating talk on discrimination by algorithms and people by Sindel Vanathan that I've linked here. Um, in the slides that you can that you can watch and, and learn more about. But overall, so so just to say, to summarize, algorithms can be biased, but they can also be fixed, and that's an important research agenda that people have been working on uh, more recently. Design of fair algorithms. Next, we're going to talk about gender identity norms, uh, and a very nice paper by Bertrand et al. from 2015. Identity considerations were imported from social psychology into economics in multiple papers by Akalov and Cranton in 2000, uh, in particular in 2000. Uh, there's a very nice book about identity economics if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, gender identity norms are uh, an important uh, example or application of such um, uh, norms or identity considerations uh, more generally. Uh, in particular, um, uh, Akalov and Cranton, or, or we here as well, focus on two social categories, men and women. Uh, and for simplicity, we can also just talk about husbands and wives, understand that things are more complicated in reality, but for simplicity, we're going to focus on that um, for now. Um, what do we mean by gender identity? Well, gender identity is something that changes payoffs from different action as dictated by some prescriptive norms. What might those norms be? Well, one norm would be men should not do women's work in the house, in the home, like cooking, cleaning, uh, and so on. Uh, some men might consider that as women's work, and they might feel particularly high disutility from doing so um, uh, if they violate that norm. Another norm would be men should earn more um, than their wives. Now. Uh, husbands now lose identity, experience lower utility and circumstances when these prescriptions are violated, when, the, when he does uh, housework, or when his wife earns more than half of the household income. Notice that um, wives might also lose identity. Um, uh, uh, for simplicity, we're going to talk more uh, only about husbands um, doing so for now. Um, now, Bertrand et al. Um, uh, particularly focus on the, the uh, prescription that men should earn more than their wives. And uh, it's important to notice that this particular gender identity norm would only matter in a world where a woman could, um, uh, or would not matter in a world where a woman uh, could never earn more than uh, her actual or potential husband. But if women are held back by technological factors, by education, etc., and never even earn uh, close to as much as their husbands or potential husbands, well, then the gender identity norm, identity norm is kind of irrelevant. However, as women make gains in the labor market, uh, these such slow-moving gender identity norms uh, can become increasingly uh, relevant, and particularly increasingly relevant um, constraints. So now, as women have more and more earnings potential, and are might uh, uh, be quite likely to earn more than their husbands, these norms really bite and might hold women um, back. Now, how would you still, uh, study this question empirically? 
what the idea here in uh, Bertrand et al. is that, well, if um, husbands um, lose identity when their wives earn more um, than half the household income, well, then they will um, uh, 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 try to avoid such situations either in, in various ways, in particular by uh, avoiding such marriages in the first place, but also if those marriages happen, they might, that might lead to divorces and so on, and those marriages might break up. So the idea of the paper then is, look, is to look for a missing mass in couples, where uh, um, particular in places where the husband earns just a little bit more um, than their wife. Now, how do they do that? Well, they have to look at the distribution of relative income uh, using um, US uh, admin data. What do I mean by relative income? Relative income is the income between the husband and the wife. They'll have essentially uh, their very nice uh, survey uh, uh, data of the survey income and program participation. These are um, uh, is a series of um, representative national panels. There are about 70,000 couple level observations from 1990 to 2004. This includes couples only uh, in which both the husbands and wives are earning positive income. So uh, notice that this is not about like husband and wife working at all. So it's not about women being at home versus working, but it's about um, where cases where both couples, uh, both uh, uh, spouses have positive income. Um, uh, the, their income measure is annual total labor income uh, plus self-employed uh, income as well. Now using that data, Bertrand et al. can now uh, compute the shares of couple earning different fractions of, uh, uh, of total income. So we're going to show you is the fraction of the uh, wife as a share of total income in the household. And that's graphed using 20 bits. What does this graph look like? You can see here the share um, earned uh, by the wife. Um, and this is the fraction of couples. This is this overall. So this is like all the couples. These are 20 bins. This all adds up to 100% overall. And what you see is perhaps not surprisingly that the share the fraction of couple um, for which the share of earned by the wife is like uh, higher than 50% is not super high. That's not surprising given that men on average earn more than uh, women. So that's not the question here. The question here is, is there a missing mass just about 50%? About the idea is, if, suppose there's some couples where um, uh, uh, women earn 45 or 46 or even 49%, there, the norm does not cause an issue or there's no identity problems because the husband earns somewhat more and feels happy about it. But as soon as you cross the threshold to like 51%, now there's a problem. Now the woman earns more, the husband feels uncomfortable, unhappy, um, and so on. And, uh, 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 and that problem might lead to those marriages disappearing in, in various ways. A, they might not form in the first place. Husband and uh, potential husband and wife might never even marry because the husband gets like uncomfortable and does not want to marry somebody who earns more. Um, second, there might be divorces. These marriages might essentially dissolve because there's lots of conflict in the household. Now, how does that manifest here? You can look at like if you come, if you look at the graph and if you look at this line here coming from the left towards 50%, you can kind of look at like try to predict, and this is kind of the idea of the, um, uh, the empirical strategy, you can try to predict what fraction would you expect uh, there to be just about 50%. And when you do that, you think, you know, the fraction should be about um, uh, something like 7%, should be about here, but in, instead this is jumped down to about 6%. So there's about 1% of couples are missing here, there's a missing mass going on here, um, which suggests that there are some marriages that are, do not happen or that get dissolved um, because of those identity concerns. This is what I already said here. There's a cliff to the right of um, 0.5 in the distribution of relative earnings across couples. Um, and that's an implication of the prescription that men should earn more um, than their wives. Now, what are the mechanisms behind this um, missing mass? Um, Bertrand and I have a wealth of evidence, uh, additional evidence showing those mechanisms. In particular, they show three um, mechanisms, which is first, missing couples did not form in the first place. So when you look at like, um, when you just randomly match men and women, um, uh, some of which where men have higher earnings potential compared to women and the other way around, the couples where women are earning just somewhat less than women are just much less likely or less likely to uh, marry compared to couples where women are just earning somewhat less than men. 
Second, such couples are less happy and stable and more likely to end in divorce. So conditional on marrying, they're more likely to get divorced as marriages just um, uh, end unhappily. And that's, of course, then also contributes to this missing mass. And then third, in cases where wives have higher earnings potential than their husbands, they decide now to work less outside of the household or you know, um, put in less effort at work so they get less promoted, which then sort of um, uh, uh, pushes down their earnings or you know, increases the husband's earnings uh, in relative terms, such as that in such cases, the woman earns uh, less than 50%. And that also leads to that missing mass. In fact, what you see here is this increase in mass going from like 20 to 40%, which perhaps is also like the, uh, the reason because some of the mass that's missing here is pushed here um, to the left. Now, um, in addition to um, working less outside of the household and just working a few hours and like working less overtime and so on, um, women then are also um, held back by non-market and childcare work. So women, in particular women who are um, are earning um, uh, just a little bit more than their husbands are doing more non-market and child care work, which is um, often called the second shift. So the idea here is that the husband's ego or his identity gets like uh, threatened by the woman earning more than he does. And then he can particularly not do the child care or non-market work. So the, end, the woman ends up not only working more outside of the household and earning more and being more productive in that work, but also doing more work uh, at home um, and uh, in addition um, to that. That's essentially what's called the second and double uh, shift. Now, an additional issue that um, uh, or, uh, is a really important still contributor to uh, the gender gap is the arrival of children. Um, and this is a very nice paper by Clavin and Al that looks at People's earning, um, in particular, the earning, uh, uh, how earnings evolve after the birth of a couple's um, first um, child. This is an event study that looks at uh, uh, years over time um, uh, for men and women. And what you see essentially for men, uh, these are earnings, and on the right here you have hours worked. For men, essentially, there's barely any difference, if any difference, uh, of the um, of earnings uh, once the first child is born. Um, essentially, uh, men's earnings tend to be um, pretty flat. In contrast, of course, there could be like further growth that's avoided, but you know, at least there's no reduction in, in men's earnings. This is, by the way, the uh, Danish data. Now, um, for women, however, um, there's a clear reduction in, in earnings. And um, uh, the long run child penalty is about um, uh, uh, almost 20%. So essentially women after, if you look at like men and women that earn the same to start with, um, women uh, earn about 20% less in the long run uh, uh, that is due to like the first child or after that, or that this gap arises after the first child is born. This is true for earnings. It's also true for hours worked and there the penalty is about 10%. It's also true for wages as in like how much are people paid conditional on uh, uh, working. So part of that is women working less, but part of it is also women be earning less, um, uh, like being promoted less, being paid less, getting fewer raises and so on once the child is born. Um, one very interesting fact is that in this paper is that child penalties are transmitted through generations from parents to daughters, suggesting uh, an influence of child environment on uh, gender identity. There seems to be something about the gender identity, about like uh, the woman is supposed to take care of the child and that runs in the family, and that leads to particularly large um, uh, what they call child penalties um, uh, uh, for those kinds of um, uh, women uh, compared to men. Now, one thing you might say is, well, couldn't we have some gender neutral family policies that alleviate that? And in particular, in academia, for instance, um, uh, one uh, idea is one could use gender-neutral tenure clock uh, stopping policies um, to alleviate um, uh, such issues. And the idea is that, in particular, sort of our early years in the career are particularly valuable. So the very least we can do is we can stop the, the, the tenure clocks um, to help um, women or couples to um, uh, deal with childcare. And many, many uh, universities and research uh, intensive universities in the US have adopted such what's called gender neutral tenure clock um, policies um, in the US. Now, 
uh, what do I mean by gender neutral? Essentially, if a couple um, has a child, not only um, uh, does the, uh, uh, the, the, the woman, um, if she has given birth to the child, uh, does she get a, uh, an extension in the tenure clock, but also the, uh, the spouse um, will get such an extension as well. So it's gender neutral um, in that sense. Now, what do such policies then do? Well, they're intended to involve men more in childcare and sort of like foster that. The idea being like, if you only give that extension to, to, to women, it sort of like pushes women to um, uh, uh, take care of their children and sort of not do, do, do work. And perhaps if we involve uh, both uh, spouses or parents in, in, in the childcare, uh, 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 providing this gender neutral tenure clock stopping policies might contribute to that. But of course, there's no enforcement and thus potentially um, uh, of such policies and that potentially these policies might be even enhancing gender inequality. And particularly if it's the case that if men uh, take uh, advantage of this tenure clock stopping policies by essentially just having another year to do research, but still don't do very much in supporting the child, then men might actually benefit from it while, while women might um, uh, not benefit at all, in part because relatively they're going to do worse compared to men. And um, so uh, uh, Antecol et al. look, in fact, at, uh, at the impact of these adoptions of these uh, 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 supposedly gender neutral um, uh, uh, tenure clock stopping policies, and they find that um, the introduction of this policy at top 50 economics uh, department substantially reduced female um, tenure rates by increasing male tenure rates. So essentially what looks like a um, neutral policy, in fact, is not gender neutral at all. It makes things worse for women and um, better for men. Let me tell you about one final paper on uh, gender, identity, or gender identity and uh, the labor market. This paper is called Acting Wife, Marriage Market Incentives and Labor Market Investments. It's by Borch Sinanel, and it asks the question whether women avoid career-enhancing actions because these actions signal undesirable or seemingly undesirable traits, such as ambition, uh, to the marriage market. Um, there's two parts in the paper. Um, uh, one part is just observational uh, data that finds that while married and unmarried female MBA students perform similarly when their performance is unobserved by classmates, such as on exams or problem sets, Unmarried women have um, lower participation grades, which are observed by their classmates. And so the idea here is that only unmarried um, uh, female MBA um, students have uh, uh, incentives on the, uh, the marriage market. And therefore, um, when their participation is uh, observed, when their, their performance is observed, they might want to scale back their ambition um, because they look too ambitious uh, on the marriage market and that might be um, adversely interpreted by potential um, uh, dates. And of course, married women, uh, since they're already married, don't have that incentives, um, so they don't engage in such behavior. As you might know, there's lots of dating uh, going on. So lots of um, MBA students are actively looking for um, a spouse during their experience, both men and women. Now, in addition, they have a field experiments with MBAs in which they vary the expectation whether um, a responses in a real stake placement questionnaire um, is going to made, be made public, in particular, whether it's going to be observed by their peers. And now female, um, uh, single female students reported lower desired salaries and willingness to travel and work long hours on those questionnaires when they expected their classmates to see their preferences. That is to say, when these uh, questions are public, uh, single female students reported lower, um, uh, lower um, uh, ambition uh, as manifested by desired salaries and willingness to travel and work hours presumably because they want to look more favorable on the marriage market. Notably, other groups' responses were unaffected by um, such peer observa observability. So in other groups, it didn't matter whether it's in public and in private. In addition, there's a second experiment that indicates the effects were driven by the observability um, by single male peers. That is to say, um, if another woman saw um, the information, that didn't matter so much. But if this other single male peer were, uh, was likely or possibly going to see that information, then uh, uh, these effects would um, show up. So that's um, overall showing that uh, essentially what's uh, perceived to be undesirable traits 
um, uh, uh, such as ambition, um, if that that is perceived to to be damaging on the on the marriage market, that can then in turn uh, reduce ambition and then contribute to the gender gap um, uh, uh, overall. Okay, let me tell you now about a final paper on uh, uh, saying no and on demand and supply for different tasks. This is a very nice paper by Rastel and Al uh, and asks the question whether women say no often enough. And so that's uh, motivated by the observation that female faculty members spend um, fewer hours on research and more hours on uh, university survey committees than male faculty. They also are more likely to have um, positions on university-wide committees they advise more undergrad students and participate more in departments and college level committees than male faculty. Um, more generally, in uh, mid-level jobs, men more than women evaluate their individual task assignments as challenging, and this is um, partially attributed to differential uh, task assignments by supervisors. So, uh, if you sort of see that um, uh, these differences, you might ask the question. Well, why do women um, uh, 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 decide to spend or spend their work time differently? And there's two di types of dimensions here. One is demand and one is supply. Um, so demand is essentially the question whether uh, uh, sex differences in the types of tasks that women and men are asked to do uh, 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 works. Is that due to like essentially what they're being asked? Um, and are women more likely than men to be asked to do what's called non-promotable tasks, tasks that are not really helpful for their career, for getting promotions? And then you might ask why that's the case. Supply is what are the sex differences in the willingness to agree to perform non-promotable tasks when asked, so conditional on being asked, are women more likely to say um, yes? And um, again, are women more likely to, than men to say yes to non-promotable tasks? Now, um, why do we care? Well, there's an individual decision-making perspective, which is that people might make suboptimal decisions how to allocate their work at, uh, uh, time at work and understanding these underlying reasons and potential uh, intervention. We're trying to sort of understand these underlying reasons, which will lead them potentially to some interventions to improve decision-making for certain individuals, which have a lot about behavioral economics. Is. But there's also a managerial and social planner perspectives that organization may not be using their resources more, most effectively, and if you sort of reallocated some of the tasks, um, uh, uh, that would reduce, that would increase um, output overall. And then finally, there's a public policy perspective. Well, if these sex differences in the allocation of time explain uh, vertical sex segregation, essentially like women not being promoted enough, then it would help us sort of improve gender equity um, overall, and perhaps also try to um, reduce the gender gap. Now, what are these promotable and non-promotable tasks in the type of like academics? A promotable task is a task that's doing research. That's essentially what people are evaluated on eventually, uh, but also any other task essentially that's seen where other people will um, reward you for when you do it. And non-promotable tasks are essentially tasks that are often discretionary. Many people could do the task and everybody wants the task to be done, yet everybody prefers somebody else to do it. For example, it would be an ethics committee at the university Surely we should have one, um, but surely sitting on the committee will not help people get promoted or get tenure when it comes to research. Now, um, the, the authors now do a field study with faculty uh, at a large public university, and they sent essentially emails from the chair of the faculty um, uh, senate asking them to, to, to volunteer to join one of several university-wide faculty senate committees. And the clear answer uh, in the study is that women are much more likely to volunteer um, when asked. Now, that is an interesting fact, but it doesn't really necessarily let us disentangle the demand and supply explanation that, we, that I showed you previously. So in addition to that, uh, the authors do a lab experiment in which they do what's called the threshold public goods scheme. Um, uh, and this is uh, sort of very much trying to mirror, like um, resemble the reality. In this game, a small group needs to find a volunteer for a task and uh, participants are anonymously matched into groups of three they're randomly rematched for each of um, 10 rounds. Uh, the game is uh, set up such that everyone prefers that the task be undertaken by someone other than themselves. Um, people get two minutes to decide whether to invest. And so the task is essentially you have to click a button and, and then you invest some money. Only one person can invest and the round ends when somebody invests. If no one invests, group members all earn $1. 
if a person invests, that person earn, uh, earns uh, $1.25 and the remaining group members earn uh, $2. The clock ticks down until one person invests or no investment is made in two minutes. So the game is essentially set up in a way such that, that everybody wants that somebody, and it's clear that somebody should invest, but nobody wants to invest because you know, if you invest, you get only $1.25, or if you don't invest, um, or somebody else invests, and you don't invest, you get $2. Now, in this game, women are significantly more likely to invest. You essentially see the probability of investing here on the left side by round, and the red line, which is the upper line, the women line, the female line is way, way higher compared to the male line. So there's much higher probability of investing in this game. Now, why are women more likely to invest? Is it the case that women believe that the corporation is necessary for an optimal group decision, but men believe that the corporation isn't required? So it could be that women sort of think that they're like, well, somebody, uh, if I don't do it, nobody else does it. And men essentially think, well, somebody else can do it. In particular, women could do it if they're in the group. So uh, then the authors do the same experiment again, um, using uh, single sex uh, sessions. Uh, um, where uh, essentially all three um, people in the session are female or all uh, people in the session are, are male. And then what they find is essentially, interestingly, these differences in gender now go away entirely. There's no gender differences in same-sex um, sessions anymore. So uh, just to summarize, so um, uh, experiment one, when uh, there's a mixed gender, um, women are more likely to invest. And in experiment two, women and men are equally likely to invest. Now, one question you might ask is, well, is it the case that really, um, is not this really about beliefs? So it could be that like, um, uh, uh, there's no, in fact, no differences in the preferences for investments. It's not like women are necessarily nicer than men, but rather there are differences in beliefs that the women will invest. In particular, if there's a woman in the group, everybody else might think, oh, the woman is gonna invest. Uh, and the woman might think like, well, if others don't invest uh, or others will not invest, and since she might believe that, she might have to or like think that she needs to do it herself. Otherwise, um, everybody will end up with one dollar and less money. So now there's a third experiment here um, where um, people are asked um, uh, 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 to essentially pick whom they would like to, to ask. And so there's four people per group and three people can invest and the incentives are four. These are like they're called the green players. And one person is unable to invest, um, but ask one of the three to invest. Uh, 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 importantly, the request is actually not even binding. Uh, that's the red player. And the red player is essentially wants the investment to happen is incentivized um, uh, that that happens. So this is kind of what this looks like. You would get like three different players here and you can essentially decide whom you would like to, to, to ask. And it's set up, of course, that you can see the gender. Some are male and some are um, female. Now, women are way more likely to be asked. Um, this is the total times asked uh, to invest for male and female players. This is the relative frequency. And you essentially see the distribution here is way shifted to the right for women um, compared to men. Now, is it better to ask a woman? Well, absent a request, invest, the investment rate actually does not differ by gender. But when asked to invest, women are more likely to comply. So when the woman is asked to invest, 76% of women invest compared to 14 but not asked. In contrast, men are also more likely to invest when asked, but it's only 51% compared to 14% when not asked. So the marginal increase of being asked is higher for women um, than for men. So if you're thinking about like whom should you ask, well, you kind of want to ask the woman because the woman is more likely um, uh, to comply with your request. And so now, if women, since women are more likely to be expected um, to say yes, they also ask more. So that sort of says, you know, the gender differences get amplified by increased demand for women to contribute. But particularly if there's a man and a woman where both can think about like one of them could do it, the man will think, well, the woman will do it anyway. The woman will think, well, the man is not going to do it and he's going to think that I will do it anyway. And so then the woman ends up doing it uh, more. In addition, um, uh, when there's an opportunity to ask somebody, but asking is kind of costly and you just want to find somebody who will do it, well, whom will you ask? You will ask the woman because then she's more likely to comply and more likely um, to say yes. Um, let me sort of summarize um, what we um, uh, discussed. So first is large uh, gender wage and earnings gaps. They have been reduced um, uh, uh, due to technological advances and other improvements over time, but they're, they're are so persistent um, gender differences um, in the US and many other countries. 
bias beliefs and identity concerns play in a major role in explaining um, those differences. Um, in addition, there are some feedback mechanisms between the demand and supply of non-promotable tasks that could be uh, that are potentially quite important. Of course, I showed you only a lab experiment, but these could be really important in real-world situations. So not only is it that uh, what matters is what women decide to do, but also what they are asked to do by others, in part as a response to their propensity to say yes or no to certain tasks. Um, better understanding these issues can now help us mitigate the gender gap, and we can sort of then by understanding these issues better and particular beliefs, you might be able to improve uh, uh, or um, correct biased beliefs and therefore um, close um, the gender gap potential. What's next in the next few lectures? Lecture 19, we'll talk about frames, defaults, not just in mental accounting. Please read Major and Share 2001. And lecture 20, we'll look about, talk about malleability, malleability and inaccessibility of preferences. Please read Ariely um, 2003 um, for that. Uh, that was all I have to say. Um, thank you so much.